in the preceding lecture, I mentioned that ethanol can be used to extract compounds from food objects that, that it is mixed up with. But the same thing is true of extraction of compounds in oak barrels. And oak barrels play an important role in, uh, in the processing of beers and wines and other, and other beverages as well. So it's important to talk about those. So what is an oak tree? Well, here's, here's an oak tree. This happens to be a French oak, if it matters. I'll write that down. It's a French oak. The idea that different populations of oaks exist in different parts of the world is going to come back to us in a few minutes. Um, let's look at some of the components of oak. Here's tannic acid. We're all familiar with the term tannins. These give rise to both some color and some bitterness. It doesn't matter what the structure of tannic acid is. Right? Or let me see, tannic ic acid. Doesn't matter to, to our discussion for what the, of what the structure of tannic acid is, but I'll stop and point out a couple of things to you. Phenols, right? Polyphenols. Look at this structure and tell me where you see phenolic, phenolic structures. And here actually is a carbohydrate structure, which is interesting too, but that's beyond, beyond our scope here. So oak barrels full of interesting chemicals such as polyphenols. These compounds can act as antimicrobials. Why would that be important? Well, of course, ethanol itself can act as an antimicrobial, oddly enough, right? Limiting the growth of, of perhaps harmful microorganisms in, in the product. Um, but these other compounds as well are sometimes referred to as bacteriostatic. Let me write this term down. Bacteriostatic, what does that mean? It's, it it re retards or stops the growth of microorganisms in the product. So again, tannins, such polyphenols such as tannins, but there are also others. I referred to these, these volatiles, right, that can be extracted. Why are these going to be important? They're going to give rise to flavors and aromas of the, of, the, of the stored ethanol. There's also lactones. So these are lactone structures, these two molecules here one of which is a cis lactone. Why do I tell you that this one is a cis and this one is a trans? Again, this is something that you might, your eyes might be glazing over if you're not interested in the organic chemistry. Suffice it to say that they're different, right? They're different in term, just in terms of the orientation of these chemical bonds. That make, can make a big difference in terms of, in terms of flavor uh, characteristics. So here's a barrel and we see that the barrel is derived from staves staves made of oak that are bound together with these metal bands. And, uh, but the, as I mentioned, there are different kinds of oak. There are French oaks. French oaks tend to be higher in tannins, higher tannin concentrations. Whereas American oaks, different species of oak, tend to be higher in lactones. Now, um, this is a point of a pretty significant amount of research, and I'm going to take a minute to belabor it. There seems to be some disagreement in the in the literature as to whether American oaks are really higher in lactones or not. What they really seem to be higher in, though, is cis lactones relative to trans lactones. Different in their concentration of cis lactones relative to the French oak. This has an important uh, this has important consequences in terms of the flavors, and we see then that French French oak is preferred in many cases for wines, whereas American oak is more useful for spirits. So we see again that the, the, the characteristics of some object, right, natural product, play an important role in the development of the flavors of the food and beverages that we consume. So ethanol extracting these items from the barrels. All right, ah, okay, so we're about to start getting into wine, but let me first break apart our fermented beverages into two classes. The, let's start with the wine types. And in a wine type beverage, we're gonna be talking about the fermentations of sugars in juices. That is to say, simple sugars, right? So if we think of starch, 
it's a I told you that it's a polymer of glucose. It's a sugar polymer, but those that sugar, that glucose is not immediately available for consumption by the fermenting organisms. So that's a different kind of beverage. So the wine type beverages are those who in which the bugs ferment the sugar that's present already in the juice. Now, let's see what we can see. So what I'm giving you at this slide is just a, a whole slew of different um, different kinds of wine type beverages without showing you wine proper, uh, just to give you a sense of the variety of compounds of food items that are used and have been used historically, have been used historically to create uh, alcoholic beverages. Let's start with mead because it's so common and so and prevalent, uh, nor, all the, ranging from Europe, and this is an ancient beverage, uh, uh, in Europe all the way to China, um, we see evidence of, um, of honey-based liquids, uh, honey-based fermented beverages, uh, perhaps as early as uh, 7,000 years ago. So let's write that down as something like 4,000 BCE evidence of that. I'm not going to go into that evidence in this lecture. Um, we also see similar kinds of honey-based beverages in South Asia, Southern Europe, and Africa. And, uh, and interestingly, the Maya, pre-contact Mayan society, fermented honey in a beverage called balache. All right. So what else besides honey is there? Obviously, honey is a great source of, of simple sugars that can be easily fermented. But there's other sources as well. We've talked about how wonderfully full of sugar milk is. And so and we've actually talked about kumis before. And that's derived from mare's milk. Um, and that's Mongolian beverage. Another important one, especially uh, in, um, in the tropical latitudes, palm wine derived from palm trees. Uh, we're talking about Africa and South and South Asia mostly, um, and there's even plenty of other New World alcoholic beverages that are produced. Uh, again, of the wine class, one that's really interesting to me is this: uh, the Iroquois. We don't have a term for what they what, for what the Iroquois used pre-contact, but or, um, but what they did was ferment maple sap into into slightly alcoholic beverages. Um, northern, northern central Mex Mexico, we have a, a, a wine type beverage called tepache, derived from pineapples. And of course, there's pulque, derived from the maguey. Okay, fine. What about beer? Beer type beverages. So I want to point out the fundamental difference between the wine type beverages from the beer type beverage. And that has everything to do with the conversion of starch, right? Those, those polymers of glucose that are unavailable for fermentation uh, into sug simple sugars that the yeast can act upon. Okay, this is a, a lot going on in this slide. Let's move in clockwise fashion, starting with sake. So sake is a beverage that we associate with Japan, derived from the grain rice. So we have to mobilize the starch bound up in the rice grain so that the, far so the fermentation can take place. Likewise, in Thailand, Thailand, there's a beverage called sato, right? Also derived from from rice. Uh, moving uh, westward, we come to Turkey, and the beverage bosa can be made a variety of a variety of different um, grains, ranging from corn, which is of course a new world, uh, a new world grain, wheat and millet as well. Uh, there's a Namibian beverage, oshikundu, made from millet. Uh, in Brazil, the uh, indigenous peoples of Brazil make a beverage called kawim. They'll use manioc, maize, and plantain, all three uh, native to the New World. Of course, Peru, we're going to come back to, uh, and the Andean cultures uh, were brewing chicha from, from maize uh, uh, well b before contact. And there's even some interesting um, um, Southwest Indian be uh, beverages, Southwest indigenous populations, tesween or tesguino, uh, also derived from maize, slightly alcoholic. Uh, now let's not leave out Europe because there's some fun stuff to talk about there as well. Sati, that's Finland. Sati, derived from, uh, the sugars are derived from wheat, barley, and, and or oats. And kvass is actually bread. 
but that's a Russian or U- or Ukrainian or, uh, beverage. Uh, now, uh, again, back to uh, northern China or Mongolia, we have chong, barley, millet, and rice again. And then um, a Huangju uh, is a beer-type beverage derived, again, from barley, millet, and rice. These are ve- grains that were available Again, very early in human history. Let's place that number down here again. Around 4,000 BCE. So, people have been making alcoholic beverages, whether they're of the wine type or they're of the beer type, for thousands of years, since the, since the dawn of human history. Since the dawn of human history, we've been relying on our partners, the microorganisms, to help us create our, 